right now, uh, the nation that I live in, the United States of America, and I know many of you are watching us from other nations of the world, but of turmoil, things are happening. And yet, I believe that God is up to something magnificent in the earth, and I believe God is up to something magnificent in his church. But I also believe that we need to understand the times and know what we need to do. Now is not a moment to shy away and duck our heads and put them in the sand and not pay attention, especially as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to the things that are happening. But now is the time for us with clarity, precision, and clarion voices to declare the word of God and believe for the spirit of God to bring healing to our nation, to those things that so discord and divide, and I believe a supernatural transformation is already underway. So pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for these moments. Thank you for this time. Thank you for allowing us to be a voice in this moment to declare your word to your people and to the nations of the earth. We decree today a great day of transformation and revelation in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I want you to open with me in your Bibles very quickly. I want you to open with me to the book of Acts chapter number 10. I want you to open with me to the book of Acts chapter number 10. I'm going to read quite a few verses now from Acts chapter number 10. And I want these verses to serve as a backdrop in some degree to what I believe the Spirit of Grace has laid upon our hearts to share today. And I'm going to read a bit of it, although uh, the passage may be familiar to some. I'm going to read a little more than I would normally read, and then I'm going to share some things that the Spirit of God has placed upon my spirit to share, and we will, I'm certain, conclude with some understanding relative to uh, what we shall read uh, in the next few moments. Uh, right now, uh, and I was, as I was preparing and praying and uh, doing those things that are required of me as a man of God to speak the word of God to you today, I got a phone call yesterday from a brother of mine, a comrade in London, England. He really is one of those uh, partners and people that help coordinate our ministry operation in uh, the UK and in Europe, strong brother, and he was sharing with me, uh, calling me from London yesterday and sharing with me how that in the streets of London yesterday, men and women were protesting. He said there were 10, 15,000 people outside of Downey Street where the prime minister uh, uh, resides uh, in the UK, in London, and as he was sharing it with me, he sent me footage, and I was uh, not amazed, but I was impacted by how right now around the globe something is happening, uh, and something is happening that initiated and centered in the United States of America, but it's larger than the United States of America, although the United States is partly responsible for it, uh, not only for the issue that has arisen, but I believe is going to have to be in some degree responsible for bringing the answer. And I believe the church of the Lord Jesus Christ must be a part of that answer. If there is something that has become very clear, and I'm going to read in just a moment, but I want you to pay attention to what I'm saying. There's something that's become very clear to me. It is that every individual who cares about what is happening in the earth right now must take a stand and whatever realm of endeavor or responsibility they are in, if they really want to see change and transformation come, they must approach that change and transformation from wherever they are set, from whatever realm or field of endeavor. Well, I am a bishop in the Lord's church. I am a churchman. I was raised in this, not professionally. 
I was called of God. And as a man called of God in this moment, as a prophetic voice in this moment, I cannot pay attention to what is going on around me and not speak the word of God into it and speak the word of God to it. And the prophetic function is a, is a, is a it's an interesting function because there are times when you must say things that uh, comfort the afflicted uh, and then there are times that you must also say things that afflict the comfortable. And so in that realm and in that role and responsibility, I pray that God will give you and I ears to hear, eyes to see and hearts to perceive and understand not only what is happening but what the Spirit of God is saying and what the church of the Lord Jesus must do. I'm going to read in Acts chapter 10 and verse number 1. If you've got a Bible, I want you to uh, read along with me. It says, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. He was an Italian, a, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who prayed, uh, who, uh, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for, send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, everybody say the next day. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. When he became, then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. This was a prophetic trance, a vision. And he saw heaven opened and saw an object like a great sheep bound at four corners descending to him and let down to earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Now I want you to get it because he's having a vision, a supernatural vision. And in the vision, he sees that which appears unclean to him. And the voice tells him to eat, but he says, no, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times and the object was taken up into heaven. Now I want you to, to stay with me. Now while Peter, was, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had sent meant, which he had seen meant, behold men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, behold, three men are seeking you. Arise therefore and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Now, if you know anything about this story, and I know I'm reading a lot, but it's very important. I cannot take for granted that anybody fully understands. If you know about this, you know that Peter goes down to Cornelius' house and he preaches. I want you to go down to verse number 34. I want you to go down to verse number 34. So these men come, they take Peter, the apostle, to Cornelius' house. And when Peter gets into the house, that's where we come in now at verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all these things which he did. I want you to go down to verse number 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, in other words, while he was still preaching, 
the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed, now those of the circumcision, that means they, these were Jews, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Now I read that to you for a reason. I, I read those passages to you and I read it in, in, in its entirety to you for a reason. Because this passage brings to bear from revelation of the scripture an issue, quite frankly, that I think we in the church and especially the church in the United States of America, but really the church globally must now begin to understand and deal with. It brings to light a reality that I think many of us in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ have not truly processed and truly understood. And I believe that our lack of understanding, processing, and realizing it is part of the reason that we are dealing with some of the issues in our nation regarding race and ethnicity. And I'll use the term race because it is the colloquial expression, but it is not a factual expression. It's one of the reasons why I believe we are still dancing around the fruit of the matter and have never really laid the ax to the root of the matter, to the root of the tree. Now, what are you getting at, Bishop McClendon, where you want to go? We'll deal with this in just a moment, but I must once again say that my exhortation, see my responsibility, my current exhortation is for the new covenant believer. It's for the new creation in Christ Jesus. And I said on last week, I, I do not actually expect others to agree or to understand why, because those of us who are born from above, those of us who are born from above and filled with the spirit of God, who have called the Lord Jesus Christ and trusted in him and his finished work for our salvation and called him Lord, we as believers have agreed and settled on the fact that the word of God is truth. Once again, John chapter 17 and verse 17, Jesus prays, sanctify them, meaning the believer, by your truth, your word is truth. And so if you are a believer in Christ Jesus, if you are born from above, if you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, then you and I must agree that the word of God is truth for the Bible says that it is. Now, why is that important? Because what the scripture reading I just read to you bears out is very relevant to what the nation and the nations of the earth are dealing with right now. We, especially here in America, we are a nation right now that is wrestling with our inability to reconcile ourselves to an historical lie. Now, what do you mean by that? Uh, we, are, we are a nation. You look at what is going on in, in the streets of the United States of America and you wonder what's going on. We are a nation that is wrestling with our inability to reconcile ourselves to a historical lie. And because the church in America has not refuted the lie and has accepted the terms uh, of the erroneous narrative, she has been powerless to assist in providing an answer. I'm gonna say that again. Because the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has not refuted the lie of racism, has not refuted the lie of race, because she has not refuted it and has accepted the terms of the current narrative, she has found herself powerless to actually provide an answer. Now, what do you mean by that? I want to show you a couple of scriptures. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, very quickly. I want you to see this. Go to Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 13. Matthew chapter 5. I want you to see this. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 13. In Matthew chapter 5, verse number 13, Jesus says something powerful. Something powerful that we have repeated in our pulpits, but I'm not sure that we have fully fathomed 
what it is that Jesus is saying. He's saying now to his followers, and he said to them, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Then he goes on to say, you are the light of the world, talking to the church now. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. I want you to hear what Jesus just said. He was talking to his church, and here's what he's saying. He's saying, you are the salt of the earth. Now, once again, when Jesus is speaking to the church about being the salt of the earth, salt was not simply used for flavoring. It was used as a preservative. Salt preserved meat. They didn't have refrigeration and freezers, so salt was used as a preservative. So the people who heard Jesus talking to them, and this is an exhortation to his followers, you are the salt of the earth. He, he, he's, they are understanding him to say that you're not only here to flavor the planet, you are here to preserve it. You are here to do something more than just participate in the status quo. Get it? He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, and once again, the word flavor here is a horrific translation or transliteration of the original Greek into English. The, the, the King James says, if the salt loses its savor. The New King James says, if the salt loses its flavor. The actual Greek word here is moreno, which literally means to become insipid. The word insipid means to lack interest, to lack significance, or to lack impact. Hear what Jesus says. He's saying, you, I've left you here to be the salt, the preservative of the earth. But if you, church, if you lack interest in what is going on around you, if you do not recognize that what is happening around you is significant, if you don't take a significant role, if you don't make an impact, if you become passive, he says, watch this, he says, if the salt loses its significance, if you begin to lack interest, if you begin to lack impact, watch this, how shall it be seasoned? He's not talking about reflavoring the salt, he's talking about the earth. He said, you are the salt of the earth. But if you lose your significance, if you fail to have a voice, if you do not prophetically speak into what is going on, somebody else will season it. Somebody else will determine how things go. Somebody else will determine the course of the nation. If you, church, do not speak up, then he goes on to say, you are the light of the world. Another very interesting thing here because the word he uses for light is the Greek word false, P-H-O-S, which doesn't just mean you are the, the shining. It doesn't just mean the shine. See, the word false literally means that which makes manifest. What Jesus was saying is, church, you are that which makes manifest, which by your presence distinguishes light from darkness, truth from lie. You are here not just to flavor and flash. You are here, church, to be significant, to lift your voice, to cry out against those things that are unjust and wrong, and you are here by your presence to make other things manifest. You are here to determine where the lie is and where the truth is. But if you are silent, he says, somebody else will do it. And so this is what has happened in America. Someone else has been determining the narrative and the church for too many years has been silent on this issue. You said, Bishop McClendon, you said, uh, we are a nation uh, that is wrestling with our inability to reconcile ourselves to an historic lie. What lie is that? It is the lie of race. It is the lie that we are different because of color. And I said this last week, and it bears repeating. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11 says, the life of the flesh is the blood. Acts chapter 17, verses 26 through 28, the apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says that God has made from one blood all nations, that's ethnos, ethnicities, all ethnicities of men to live upon the earth. The fact of the matter is that race, as I said last week, in its current 20th and 21st century understanding and usage is a lie. It is a white invention. It is a product 
of the Western predominantly European imperialistic and colonial system of subjugation and I declare to you again it is not in any way shape or form a divine a biblical or even a Christian concept race is not in the mind of God race is not distinguished in the Bible race is not remotely a Christian concept so my question is why does the church continue to engage in the divisive narrative of race all, all the preachers who stand in pulpits, who discuss race, are perpetuating a historic, non-biblical, non-divine, non-Christian lie. And as I was looking at what is happening in our nation over the past several weeks, I saw them. I saw them in, 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 in Confederate states in the South. I saw them begin to pull down statues and monuments of Confederate heroes in this nation. And I thought to myself, while we're pulling down statues of Confederate heroes in this nation, let us also pull down the historical lies they initiated that have been perpetuated in this nation. And one of them is that black people are a different race from white people. That is a lie. And I refuse to be silent while cities burn and people argue and riot. I refuse to be silent while preachers continue to try to make the fruit of racism more flavorful when no one has laid the ax to the root of the lie of racism in this nation. All this past week in my spirit I heard the prophetic utterance of John the Baptist in, in Luke chapter 3 and verse 9 where he says, and now the ax is laid to the root of the tree. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15 verses 12 through 15, every tree that my heavenly father has not planted that's not producing good fruit is going to be cut down. And I declare as a prophet of God, it is time to cut down the lying tree of racism that has divided people in this nation. And it is time for the church, it is time for preachers of the Lord Jesus Christ to stand up and say there is no such thing as a black race and a white race, there is one race, it is human. And within that human race, there are ethnic diversities that God has ordained to bring a flavor, if you will, to the existence on earth and not distinction. Now some would say, Bishop McClendon once again, I don't get it. What are you trying to do? Well, wh why would you make such a point? Well, anyone who understands God's word and, and all the pastors and teachers who understand the integrity of God's word and they teach us that it matters what you say. Your words have power. You create your world with your words. We have applied this to everything but this. And we keep speaking it and we keep speaking it and we keep speaking it. And I declare that the mere entertaining of the seduction to continue to debate it will produce no long-lasting results. It hasn't. Think about it. If it is a historic and biblical, uh, if it is a lie, and, and it is, I, I defy any preacher of the gospel to look into the word of God and show me anywhere where God distinguishes people on the basis of color. It is not there. It's nowhere. And I shared with you on last week, the only reference to race. The why is that important? Why are you making such a big deal about it? Why do you continue to do this? Because we must, we must finally, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must finally, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, understand what the born from above experience is and what it does and what it does not do. I'm going to say that again. We must finally reconcile ourselves to the born again or born above ex from above experience and determine what it does and what it does not do. We must understand that to be born again or to be born from above is a transformation of the spirit. When you are born again, your spirit man is reborn. But your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions and your attitude are not immediately completely transformed. I'm going to say that again. 
Your spirit is reborn and connected with God. But your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, your attitude are not immediately transformed. That's why we say, we quote always Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, and then it says, and be not conformed. Do not go with the form of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The born from above experience empowers you to begin the transformation of the mind. It empowers you to begin to see things as God sees them. Now, why is that important? Because once the spirit is born again, the mind has to be renewed to the word of God, and then the body has to come into the, uh, the submission to the born from above spirit and the renewed mind, will, emotions, and attitude. Why is this so important for us to understand? Because when you understand this, then you also understand how good, well-meaning Christian people. Now, what are you getting at, Bishop McClendon? You understand how good, well-meaning Christian people who were born again, who trusted God, and who articulated a faith in God could still make errors in their articulations and in their judgments because their mind was not renewed to God's word. Now, I'm going to say something that people are going to go up in arms about. But because uh, our founding fathers and the framers of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States were predominantly men of faith, and indeed this nation, the United States of America, was founded upon a principle for seeking religious freedom, their governing principles, their governing premises, their governing conclusions and constructs have been accepted as acceptable. Yet, when it comes to the moral, ethical, an equal treatment of the men and women they brought to this nation from the African continent and enslaved, they canonized and codified into law an immoral, unethical, and unacceptable lie reducing black men and black women to property and to three-fifths of a human being, thus creating another race, a people to be bought and sold and owned. And so the same men who penned the words in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The same men who wrote that also codified and canonized in their constitution that the men and women that they brought over from Africa and enslaved were three fifths of a human being and in the law they said that five slaves equaled three free people this is this is codified in law look look in in, in the, the, the the drawings of the constitutional amendments of 1787 and you will find this three-fifths law that slaves were three-fifths of a human being. And there is where a distinction in race was created. Because as I said before, you cannot pin those words and then with a good Christian conscience enslave another man or woman unless you first reduce them to being something less than human, something less than you, you create another race, and then you can, with a good Christian conscience, go to bed owning other men and women. So you create the lie. You create another race so you are comfortable in your Western European imperialistic Christianity. Now, you say, Bishop McClendon, how dare you speak that way about the founding fathers? I'm just reading what they wrote. And the fact of the matter is that they're Christian. And some would say, uh, 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 sh uh, uh, show it to me. Uh, put it up. Put it up on the screen. This was the three-fifths compromise. The three-fifths compromise of 1787 where it says a slave, the three-fifths compromise 
uh, and, 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 and what happened here, this was actually an articulation because they were trying to decide how the states at this time, the 13 colonies or states would be taxed. And they were trying to figure out how they would get representation for presidential elections. And because the southern states had so many more people because they had slaves, the northern states didn't want the southern states because they were slaveholders to have a larger population and therefore get larger representation in Congress and more votes to vote for president. So the creation of race was economic. It was about property and power, not about people. And so the three-fifths compromise went to say a slave was both person and property. Only three-fifths of the slave population in the state would count towards state population in a census. For the census count, five slaves equal three people. And so another race was created. Now I declare to you that one of the reasons that the Christian church in the West has lost its power and its influence, has lost its integrity with a generation of people who neither know your God nor care about your forefathers is because this lie has been perpetu perpetuated in pulpits by white preachers and black preachers alike and it's time to pull the lie down. It's time to pull it down. Why? Why is this so important? Why are you screaming at the top of your lungs? Why? Because the Bible is clear that when brethren dwell together in unity, there God commands the blessing. And when you and I start discussing our differences based on the fact that we are one race with diverse ethnic persuasions, now I am not less than you and you are not more than me. And as I said last week, without condescending or taking anything away from the Black Lives Matter movement because they have forced a conversation, the issue is not whether Black Lives Matter. The issue is, are black lives equal to you? Because until we are equal, until, until we come to the table, I was listening this past week and reading again the words of the great prophet Dr. Martin Luther King and one of the reasons why the dream of Dr. King has not come more into fruition is because he was not merely a civil rights leader he was a prophet of God and people have not understood him as a prophet what did he say? He said that one day black men and white men would sit down at the table of brotherhood where is the table of brotherhood? it is not in Congress the table of brotherhood is not in the Senate. The table of brotherhood is not in the White House. The table of brotherhood is in the church where you and I, once we are born again, become brothers and sisters, a holy nation, a hagios ethnos. You say, Bishop McClendon, you are preaching from a dreamland. No, I'm preaching from the world you were born from. And I'm preaching the truth that your God has articulated in the scripture that we have conveniently overlooked. Now why is this so important? And what, Bishop McClendon, does this have to do with the Apostle Peter? Here's what we must understand. That our Christianity and the Christianity of our, of the forefathers of this nation, we've got to understand this is our Christianity does not immediately purge us of our historically inherited bigotries or our deeply rooted traditional perspective. See, here is what we have believed. Because I am born again and you are born again and I'm filled with the Spirit of God and you're filled with the Spirit of God, we are immediately completely freed of our traditional bigotries and our traditionally inherited perspectives. But the Bible demonstrates that not to be a fact. The apostle Peter was the man who on the day of Pentecost stood up, a born again, spirit filled man. A born again, spirit filled man who stood up on the day of Pentecost and preached a message where people of different ethnicities received the word of God and were born again. After that, the church in Jerusalem begins to grow. 
We have now an apostle, spirit-filled, born again. Preacher of the gospel, presiding over a mega church in Jerusalem. And yet, in Acts chapter 10, this apostle has a revelation. He's up in prayer and he has a dream and the Bible says he sees in a vision a curtain uh, 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 coming down, a hanger coming down, filled with all kinds of four-footed beasts, things that in the Jewish law of Moses would be called unclean. And Peter, who was raised a good Jewish man, knew the codified elements of the law. This is unclean, that is clean. And so when the voice comes to him and says, rise, Peter, slay, and eat, he responds to the voice in the vision saying, no, not so. I, will, I have never eaten anything unclean. I have lived by the code. I have lived by what has been handed down to me. I have lived by what is traditional. What he didn't know is that the blood of Jesus and the word of God had changed the dynamic. And so while he has this vision already, people are coming to him from Cornelius' house. Now, what is the significance of this? Cornelius is an Italian. He is not a Jew. And a good Jew would not even go into an Italian's house. The vision that Peter saw was about the experience he was getting ready to have. And so he sees this in a vision, and the Spirit of God, as he talks about the vision, as he thinks on the vision, says, when these men come, go with them and don't doubt anything. And so Peter goes with them, and then he goes to Cornelius' house. Cornelius is an Italian, Peter is a Jew. And he goes to Cornelius' house, and he begins to preach. And when he begins to preach, the Spirit of God falls on those Gentiles, those non-Jews, those people that Peter, up to now, through his traditional bigotry and his traditional insight, would think were unclean. The Holy Spirit falls on them, and now Peter has to adjust his theology. Because the revelation of the Spirit of God has shown him that the distinctions and the divisions that he made in his mind are no longer true in the kingdom of God. And here's the point. His salvation nor his fullness of the Spirit immediately purged him of that bigotry and that tradition. It took a revelation of the Spirit of God and an encounter. And I would submit to you that... Either of the two of them by themselves would not have been enough. He needed insight from God's word, but he actually needed an encounter. And here, see, is what I am praying now will happen in the body of Christ. That not only will the revelation of the Spirit of God come to fruition and fullness, but we will begin to encounter one another in a way that only the Holy Spirit can cause that encounter to take place. You say, Bishop McClendon, why are you saying this? Why are you preaching this? Why are you dealing with this in such intensity? Because the reality is that now the axe is being laid to the root of the tree. It is clear that we will no longer be able to just deal with the fruit of the lie of racism. We now have to get to the root of the lie. Of racism. I was reading once again here recently the words of Dr. King, and I will quote them. This has been quoted so many times in the last two weeks. Everybody that, I, everybody that I've seen of uh, the African American persuasion has quoted this, but we've all only quoted a part of it. I wanted to go back and reread it again because, again, it is a prophetic utterance. And Dr. King said certain conditions continue to exist in our society which must be condemned as vigorously as we condemn riots. But in the final analysis, and this is the quote, a riot is the language of the unheard. And what is it that America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not been met. 
and it has failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice, equality, and humanity. And so in a real sense, our nation's summers of riots or protests or protests and riots, whatever you call our, our nation's summers of riots are caused by our nation's winters of delay. And as long as America postpones justice, we stand in the position of having these recurrences of violence and riots over and over again. Social justice and progress are the absolute guarantors of riot prevention. Now, you say, Bishop McClendon, what are you suggesting that we do? What, what, what does this information do? I am suggesting that as a preacher of the gospel, as a man or woman of God, as a person who is born from above, you begin to change the narrative yourself by the language that we use. Just like we have been taught, we'll have what we say. Just like we have been taught the power of our words. Just like we have been taught to create the world that we want with the words we speak. We must now begin to change our language and preachers must not try to get people of the white race to deal with people of the black race. We must proclaim there is one race. And that is human. And within that one human race, there is ethnic diversity. I was inquiring of the Lord this past week. And I was asking him about the various things that I was seeing. The various things that he was speaking to my spirit. The various things that I was hearing in the voices of men and women that I talked to. And one of the things the Lord ministered to me very clearly is he said, son, people are grappling for the answer. They don't even have the tools with which to begin to communicate. You see, the fact of the matter is, and I'm getting ready to pray, so I want you all to get ready. I'm getting ready to pray because we're going to take authority over something in the name of Jesus, but I want you to hear me. The Lord said to me, he said, just like to settle a dispute, please hear me. He, had, he said, just like if you're going to settle a dispute, you must come to terms. You must qualify the terms to settle a conflict. We call it a treaty. We, we call it uh, an armistice. Just like you must qualify terms to settle a dispute. He said, you can't even have a discussion until you qualify the terms. Until we are speaking the same, there's no need in trying to fix the issue. And I said, Lord, help me to understand this. And, and he said to me, he said, son, debating race and trying to come to a conclusion about it would be like debating what the square footage of the flat earth is. We all know the earth is no longer flat. So even if you win the argument of the square footage, you have come no closer to the truth. He said it would be like, he said it would be like trying to determine how many planets actually revolve around the earth. Because at one time, people thought the earth was the center of the solar system and all the planets revolve around it. And so you can have an argument about it, but here's the fact, whoever wins the argument is still no closer to the truth because the earth is not the center of the solar system. And the same is true with the issue of race. You can try to make it social, you can try to get justice, you can try to do this, you can try to do that, but as long as you are debating the deception, you will get no closer to the truth. Bishop McClendon. What then shall we do? You and I, like Elisha, we've got to take the prophetic mantle and strike 
the lie of racism. We have to begin to proclaim it. We actually have to change our language. That shouldn't be difficult. You were taught to say you're healed when you're feeling pain. You've been taught to say you're prospering when you still seemingly don't have enough to pay your bills. Why? Because you were told that your healing was the truth, and it is. You were told that your provision was the truth, and it is. And now the Word of God tells you your union is the truth. Your oneness is the truth. And it is. I'm calling upon men and women of God everywhere to change what you preach from your pulpit, sir. To change what you declare to the next generation. The church has lost her credibility with an entire generation of people because we have been inheritors and perpetuators of a lie. Did you hear what I just said? And I believe that it is time for you and I to settle the matter. We're going to take communion. I was in prayer this morning and I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, he said, strike the lie with the prophetic mantle. He said, strike it and watch it divide. Watch it scatter. He said, tell my people to get my word in their mouths. There is one blood one human race and I promise you I will not entertain the conversation in any other dimension no matter where I am because you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free you say Bishop McClendon what about what is happening in the society we got to do things about that too. I am not suggesting that changing what you say and praying is going to do everything. No, 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 no. But what I am saying is those of us who are children of the Most High, those of us who are part of the Holy Nation, we must go into the battle armed with the right mentality, speaking the right words, ministering the love of God. I'll never forget years ago, I was invited to a dialogue on in the church on what they called racial reconciliation it's years a few years ago short-lived didn't produce much I was quite a younger man at the time I was in my late 20s I was pastoring a church that was thriving and growing it was multi-ethnic it was multicultural it had become a phenomenon in the denomination at the time that I was in because the denomination that I was in at the time was 97% Caucasian in the continental United States and the congregation that I pastored was multicultural, multi-ethnic and they invited me to this dialogue. I was the youngest kid in the room and there were in that room men and women, black men and white men, pastors and preachers, many of them much my senior. I remember going into the room and asking the Lord, what am I doing here? He said, just sit, listen, don't say anything until I tell you to say something. That's what I did. I heard the dialogue. I heard the debate. I heard white pastors and preachers of a certain age group apologizing to black pastors for racial injustice 
feeling guilt, shame for it. Didn't really produce much. Then I heard black pastors, men and women of God, speaking about the historical injustices that had been done that were real. And there was a sense in the dialogue and if I called some of the names, you'd know some of the names that were in the room. I will not call the names. There was a sense of the dialogue from those pastors that the, 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 the white pastors who may not have necessarily been a part of the injustice owed them something. And I remember sitting there silent in my late 20s watching the conversation go back and forth. The Lord brought this up to me in the last week or so. And he said to me, in my spirit, he said, this matter will, be, will never be settled in this generation. I said, Lord, why? He said, because as long as white men feel guilty and black men feel like they're owed something, there will constantly be a conflict he said but when men and women understand that I am the reconciler it doesn't mean that the injustice hasn't been done but you don't owe me anything I'm not concerned about the sins of the past I'm concerned about the transformation of the present you don't need to apologize to me for the sins of your grandfather, your great-grandfather, your great-great-great-grandfather. And I'm not going to hold you responsible for what my great-grandmama experienced, but I will call you to task on how you deal with me. Because it is not the past. It is right now that you and I must begin to deal with. And the Spirit of the Lord said to me, he said, but there is coming a generation that will be open enough to begin to have this dialogue. And he said, and there will be a reconciliation come. And I declare to you in the name of Jesus, you and I are in that moment right now. And what needs to happen more than anything else is the blood of Jesus of Nazareth needs to flow and cleanse because it's not a black problem in and of itself or a white problem in and of itself it's a blood problem you say Bishop McClendon you are oversimplifying no there's so much more to be done but it has to begin at the table of brotherhood and that is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ I want you right where you are I want you just to begin to lift your hands if if the Word of God has come to you if you heard anything in my voice that resonated with you then I declare to you that it was not Clarence McClendon ministering to you it was the Spirit of God if truth has been revealed to you in any way shape or form if you sir if you ma'am have heard anything of the Spirit of God that I want to pray no I do not deny the years of social injustice I, I, I don't deny the inequity it is real it exists and it has affected men and women with anger and sorrow it has disoriented them it has caused bitterness but I declare in the name of Jesus that the blood of Jesus of Nazareth transforms and yes there is evil that has been perpetrated yes absolutely I don't deny it and without the Spirit of God you look at it it will anger you and cause you to retaliate but if you are a man or woman of the Spirit then God is calling you and I to respond from the truth of the word and respond from the Spirit. I said it 
the last week. When Jesus told you to turn the other cheek, he was not telling you to let somebody hit you on both sides of your face. He was saying, if you get struck here, then turn the part of you to the individual that has not been struck. You can respond from the Spirit. You can respond in love. You can respond out of the Holy Ghost. And no injustice, no inequality, no inequity can stop the power of the Spirit of God from flowing on the inside of you and changing a thing. I'll never forget when I realized that with the power of the Spirit of God, nobody could keep me down. Nobody could shut a door. You shut a door for me, the power of God will open it. You try to keep me out of it, God will take me in another way. And I'll wave at you from the inside because you can't keep me out of anywhere my Father wants me. Glory to God forevermore. You can't stop me from rising when the greater one is on the inside of me and you try to kill me go ahead put me to death three days later I'll be standing showing you the scars and telling you I'm back this is the promise this is the reality of life in Jesus Christ this is what Jesus breaks no I'm not telling you that there'll be no hurt. I'm not telling you there'll be no offense. I'm not telling you there'll be no injustice. What I am telling you is it will not be able to stop you from being who you're supposed to be, doing what you're supposed to do, and having what you're supposed to have. This is the gospel of Jesus of Nazareth. And when men and women will move in it and walk in it, it brings healing and transformation. And I am praying For Christ's body, the church. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. We must now speak up. We must speak in truth. We must speak in love. We must be relevant and significant. And God is calling you, sir. God is calling you, ma'am. I'm talking to young men and young women. Young black boys and young black girls, don't you get angry and don't you get bitter. Protest, don't riot. Speak up, but don't hate. The Spirit of God will bring healing to this matter if we will stand on His Word. But I will not entertain the lie another day. I will not preach to people they are different races when God has made them one. And you can like me or dislike me. And I defy you, scholar, skeptic. You look into the Word of God. You show me anywhere where God makes distinctions in race on the basis of color. It's not there. And if you hear this word and continue to preach it, sir, you're a liar. Ma'am, you're a liar. If you pray in the Holy Ghost, I want you to pray because I'm praying for the church. I'm praying that the historical lie be pulled on Jesus and every tree which my heavenly Father hasn't planted will be pulled down. And I declare this tree, this lie of racism that has been planted in the church, has not been planted by the Father nor Jesus of Nazareth. And I'm praying in the name of Jesus that in this generation that lie comes down. Just like the statues of Confederate soldiers are coming down. I want the lies they perpetuated, the lies they instituted, the lies that have sown division and discord, the lie that allows one man to put his knee on the neck of another man and watch life drain out of him because he somehow believes he is not his equal. I want that lie put to death. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers 
against principalities. That's not just devils, it's principles, lying principles. Principalities against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're mighty through God to pulling down strongholds, arguments. Postulations that have endured for years. We can pull it down, but we got to do it in word and deed. And now God is looking for those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. This is the truth. I was reading there this past week in Acts chapter 17 where Paul says, And there was a time where God winked at this ignorance but now he is calling all men everywhere to repent to change their mind see there are times where God allows certain ignorance to persist but when the truth is exposed he says I'm commanding you now to metanoeo to change your thinking I need people in the body of Christ praying if you pray in the spirit I need you doing it because we're gonna pray today hallelujah that this stronghold this argument be pulled down. We're going to use the Word of God. That's the truth. We're going to use the blood of Jesus. We're going to use prayer and intercession. We're going to take authority. You say, Bishop McClendon, you actually believe something you do here on a couch in California can begin to change? Absolutely. Because my Bible says one can chase a thousand. Two can put ten thousand to flight. Come on, open your mouth and pray in the Spirit. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray now for my brother and my sister. I pray now for men and women. I pray not for the world. I pray for the body of Christ. I pray for the church. I pray for the church that calls itself white and the church that calls itself black. I understand the distinctions in ethnicity. Those are real. And we need to see each other's color. I don't want my color ignored. I want it recognized. I don't want my ethnicity ignored. I want it seen. I don't want the flavor that I bring to the gospel ignored. I want it seen. But it should not make a difference in how we love one another, how we relate to one another. Pray in the Spirit. Father, in Jesus' name, we take authority now in the body of Christ over the lie of racism and I declare as a prophet of God that now the axe is laid to the root of the tree we will no longer debate the fruit of the tree we lay the axe to the root of it and we declare the lie the historical lie the invention that has been perpetuated by the church we declare in the name of Jesus that lie comes down in this generation in the name of Jesus of Nazareth my father I pray that the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus Christ would flow through the body that men and women like Peter would have a revelation that the divisions and the distinctions that they have traditionally understood and inherited are not so because of the word of God because of the blood of Jesus and I pray I pray that this nation that has been imprisoned by the prophetic words of the prophet Dr. Martin Luther King would now be liberated as they live out those words that at the table of brotherhood black men and white men in pulpits and at tables across America will begin to see that there is one race, one blood, and begin to live out the truth. I pray for a transformation to occur in the holy nation and then in the nations of the earth. Lift your hands where you are. If you pray in the Spirit, keep doing it. I'm almost done. Alabo Rabase. In the name of Jesus.
in the name of Jesus, I speak peace to you. I speak healing to you. I speak grace, grace to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, I pray that my white brothers be freed of guilt and shame. And I pray that my black brothers and sisters would be released from offense. No, don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying don't pay attention to the just I'm not saying that. I'm saying don't you let it get in your heart. No weapon that is formed against you can prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment is already condemned. This is a part of your inheritance as a son, a daughter of the living God, and your righteousness, your authority comes from Him. Your right to rise comes from Him. Your right to prosper comes from Him. Your right to be who you are called to be and do what you were purposed to do comes from Him. And you have power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and I declare to you you new creation you nothing shall by any means harm you in the name of Jesus now my father as we take communion I'm asking that the healing balm will begin to flow through your body wherever men and women are believing trusting let it be so take the bread in your hand take the bread in your hand take the bread in your hand I asked the Lord today, I said, Lord, you really want me to preach this message? It's not much of a birthday message. He said, you say what I've told you to say. Now, we're going to settle a matter. I believe in every sphere in the church, in politics, in law enforcement, in business in economics in music I believe in every sphere and realm the axe is being laid to the root of the tree do you actually believe that when the church gets something right and gets something done it'll change the nations, the communities. This is what the Bible teaches. If my people called by my name, if they'll do it, God says, I'll begin to heal the land. Perhaps it is we that have permitted the land to be destroyed. But God will heal it. Take the bread in your hand. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless this bread now and this cup. And I declare that it shall now be used for sanctified and holy use. I declare in Jesus' name that whatever the elements are, that at this moment they are utilized for exactly that which your word has determined. And I declare healing shall flow, strength shall come, and death shall be ejected 
because of the finished work of Jesus. I want you to take the bread in your hand and I want you to lift it up and I want you to say these words out loud. Say, Lord Jesus. Come on, say it out loud. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the finished work of Calvary. And by that work, I have been reconciled. I'm one with God and one with his body. I want you to say this out loud. I boldly confess on the basis of the finished work of Jesus and the integrity of the Word of God that there is one race and that is human. And all men you've made of every ethnicity from one blood this is your truth and I accept it and I boldly confess the axe is laid at the root of the tree and the lie is coming down in my generation in Jesus name let's all eat together ah Feel the power of God flowing. Take the cup in your hand. Lift it up. And say these words out loud. Say, Lord, I declare the blood has settled the matter. I declare the blood has remitted all sin and though there be injustice and though there be inequity because of the blood no weapon formed against me can prosper this is a part of my inheritance I receive it now will you say this out loud I will not allow any offense to enter in my heart. I reverse every curse. I speak the blessing and I walk in love. In the name of Jesus, let's all drink together. Lord, we ask the lie come down. Lift your hands where you are. Just worship. Worship the Lord with me just a moment.